have the pleasure of directing our Center for Climate, Society, and the Environment, the host for this evening. Thanks so much for being with us here for our first <coughs> event of this semester. To start, I'd like to recognize that we are on the ancestral lands of the Spokane tribal people and that Gonzaga as a university wouldn't exist were we not for the fact that we were invited to this land uh, by some of the communities uh, that invited us here to a great debt to repay in order to be able to be good stewards of land as they have been since time immemorial. Before uh, introducing our speaker, I wanted to mention a couple of other events that we're hosting this semester. Uh, we'll have another talk just in a few days. Uh, that one is on Zoom on communication, Christianity, and climate change. So you can catch that, register for that one. And then on February 24th at noon, we have a famous uh, activist and author, uh, Paul Kingsnorth, on Confessions of a Recovering Environmentalist, which should be excellent. Very excited to have uh, the Vatican's lead, uh, Cardinal, Cardinal Cherney, who's actually a Gonzaga alum, uh, who will be coming to campus and presenting in the Woltzen Center uh, for Performing Arts on Caring for a Common Home in this world and with this climate. It should be quite an interesting talk. Uh, th that one has tickets, uh, and they're limited, so they're free, but you need to go on and request your tickets, so make sure you go. Uh, you can just go to gonzaga.edu slash cardinal and get uh, your free tickets. And then uh, Dr. Actually, Kevin uh, Kuntz uh, is going to be talking about uh, building res resilient infrastructure. He'll be glad to know that he's now a, a got a PhD, so that's, <laughs> that's good. And then uh, Griffin Thompson, who is also a Gonzaga alum and a recent retiree from the US State Department, will be presenting our last talk of the semester on the political and ethical dimensions of the renewable energy transition. So make sure you register for those excellent events for this semester. Our uh, speaker this evening is Dr. Christopher Preston, and I'm really pleased to introduce him. Uh, we had this idea, we, I met him a few years ago when he was presenting across the river at the Eastern Washington uh, uh, River Point campus, and got to know his work a little bit. Uh, at the time, I think he had a, an NSF grant on geoengineering, uh, which is a topic that comes up quite regularly. Obviously, that's what we're uh, chatting about tonight. Uh, but there's a book, I don't know, have any of you read uh, Stim, Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future uh, book? Anybody out there? No. Oh. So he's uh, one of the great science fiction writers of our day. So it's called Ministry for the Future. Highly recommend it. Um, our city council president, Brian Beggs, who wasn't able to come tonight but is watching uh, live stream, was the person who recommended it to me. It starts off with a really uh, dramatic scene. I won't, I won't ruin the book, but the, but the beginning uh, is, covers a heat dome uh, that, that hit uh, the Indian continent uh, some years into the future, not too far into the future, and killed millions of people. And as a result, India decided to go ahead and try and, and uh, uh, try and reduce the temperature of the planet on their own. So they started to use geoengineering in order to try and, and just unilaterally uh, try and reduce uh, the problem so that fewer people died. And that gave us the idea to invite Dr. Preston for tonight. Dr. Preston is uh, an award-winning author of multiple books, including The Synthetic Age, Out Designing Evolution, Resurrecting Species, and Reengineering Our World. His work looks at how contemporary developments in technology and ecology are changing how humans view their surroundings. He's also uh, concerned about writing for popular avenues that can engage philosophical ideas uh, with, with uh, popular culture. And he's written for The Atlantic, The Smithsonian Magazine, and the BBC. His latest book is called Tenacious Beasts, Wildlife Recoveries That Change How We Think About Animals. Uh, think about animals. Uh, this investigates a number of recovering species and asks what they have to teach us. He's born and raised in England and moved to the United States in the 1990s. And he's lived most of those years in the Western United States where he enjoys mountain biking, skiing, and many activities made possible by our beautiful environment here. So join me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Preston. Thank you, Brian. Is that sound okay? Is it okay? Is it okay? Can you hear me yet? The green light is on down here. Is that working for you there? Is it enough for everybody in the room? I can, I can, oh, I got some, got some amplification. I think we're good now, right? I think we're good now. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Brian. 
Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. Thanks for inviting me here. Though I have to say, next time I'm asked to do a climate-related talk somewhere, I am going to be suspicious if it is in January. Um, I left Missoula this morning, and it is an absolute icebox over there, and it's not exactly warm over here. And so it takes some imagination to think about the gravity of the climate change problem when you're speaking on a very cold January evening. But imagination is what I want us to start this talk off with tonight. I want you to imagine something with me, okay? Imagine you have come, let's say, to an event, like a lecture or something like that. And you are in a room, maybe it's like a below ground room, there's, there's no windows in it, for example. Just like imagine this. Imagine that the room is full, maybe just kind of a little fuller than you want it to be, and maybe the air conditioning is turned up a little bit too high. And as soon as you sit down, you're sort of, you're thinking, this is a little uncomfortable, this is a little bit warm. So you kind of adjust what you're wearing a little bit. You try and kind of loosen your clothes up. Um, just breathe a little deep. Try and feel a little better about the heat, but the heat is kind of relentless. It kind of keeps building. And it goes from being a little bit of an inconvenience to being really quite uncomfortable for you. And you start to feel a little bit alarmed. You notice your watch strap is digging in to your arm because you're starting to swell a little bit with the heat. You're sweating. You feel a little nauseous. You take some deep breaths because you want to feel a little bit better. But it doesn't get better. You turn to your neighbor to say something, and you notice that you're slurring your words a little bit. The words don't come out so well. You start to feel worse and worse. You, your headache builds and starts thrumming between your ears. You start feeling a little dizzy. There's no escape. The speaker keeps going. You can see the speaker's sweating like crazy. But you're stuck. You're trapped in this room. And this little panic starts to rise inside of you. You start to really feel alarmed. And you start to realize you've got to get out. So you're looking around for a way out. You're looking for a way to kind of escape the heat. You're watching what everybody else is doing. Everybody's suffering like you are, you can tell. You've got to get out of this heat. After a couple of hours, you think, this is it. I'm, I'm finished. I've got to go. So you jump up. You run to the back of the room, grab the door, and you find the door is locked. And what was a rising panic becomes a full-on terror and fear. And as you look back in the room, you see the first couple of people starting to collapse from that heat. Now, a scenario like that is very similar to the scenario that Kim Stanley Robinson starts this book ministry for the future with, and Brian explained the scenario there. It is absolutely terrifying. In this heat wave in India, which the book describes, 20 million people die in two weeks. And at the same time, 350,000 people die in a 24-hour period in Florida. So what Robinson does is he ratchets up the drama, ratchets up the level of fear and panic. And that is his springboard into the discussion of geoengineering, which is what I'm going to talk about tonight. Now, Robinson is writing science fiction, but we don't have to journey very far into the future or even beyond the present to understand that this is very close to fact. So in that scene in Stanley Robinson's book, it is so hot that people just go sit in a lake because that's the only way they can begin to get their temperature down. The air is too humid. The heat is too great. And in that top left picture, we've got people in Turbat, Pakistan, a couple of years ago where you were getting daytime highs of 128 degrees, and it wasn't getting below 94 at night. 
bottom left, we've got Lytton, British Columbia. Do you remember this from a couple of years back? 121 degrees in Lytton in British Columbia. And the next day, the place burned to the ground. On the top right, we've got Summit Station in Greenland. That's at an elevation of 10,500 feet. And in September last year, it was raining. And it not only was raining there, one third of the Greenland ice sheet in September was melting, had surface melt. So you could go, you could walk on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet in September last year and you would find one third of it had puddles on it. And down in the bottom right there, my home country, that's London last summer and that's Heathrow Airport where the temperature was 104 degrees and the runway started melting. Because 104 degrees might not seem much in Spokane, but London is not equipped for those kinds of temperatures. So alongside these numbers, there is an immense amount of suffering that comes with this sort of climate warming. All over the world, particularly hitting the least uh, well-off, the people least able to adapt to that suffering. These extreme events, we see them in the news. Every time I go back into the classroom to teach another section on climate change, there are new photos of new disasters happening. And it's not just the extreme events. It's the gradual breaking of records. Each year, another record gets broken. Often these records are broken by more than the climatologists think possible. The temperatures are rising so fast. And with these rising temperatures, in addition to the extreme events, you get the slow onset costs of climate change. Increases in asthma, increases in cardiopulmonary disease, infectious diseases that get new ranges, for example, as insects can live in different places. Dehydration for agricultural workers, kidney disease increasing because of dehydration, respiratory problems, lethargy, difficulty concentrating, less ability to even go to work. These are all the slow onset costs of what we're facing right now. Now, I want us to step back because what I'm going to say tonight is, is philosophical. I am a philosopher, uh, and as well as talking about the technology of geoengineering, I want to step back and give us a philosophical perspective because some of the questions I want to ask require a little bit of distance before they make sense. So here's our home. It's been a very nice home. It's been a very stable home, actually, for about 12,000 years. Very little change in temperature. And everything we're familiar with uh, in terms of language and culture and environment, has all come out of this stable 12,000 year period. And then of course we did something to our home. It wasn't malicious, we weren't sort of trying to mess up the place we live. Um, there were actually some pretty good reasons to do it. Uh, we wanted to increase standards of living and to increase those standards we had to burn lots of things. We had to connect people uh, in new ways, and there were for sure plenty of goods that came out of that. But what happened is we ended that stable period. So that Holocene Earth became the Anthropocene Earth, the warmed up Earth, a different place, a completely different environment. Now, it's not that everything became unrecognizable overnight, but things did change fairly significantly. Summer became, well, some people call it now danger season. And living here in the West, we will know it means fire, it means smoke. Uh, it means a lot less blue sky days, a lot less cool evenings than we used to have. Winter has changed too. I don't know if you've been following uh, some of the stories about Europe's winter this year. 
But in the Alps, the ski resorts have been completely bereft of snow until just very recently. Uh, and so winter, yes, it's, winter will always be cooler than summer. Um, but winter will change. It will become a different thing. And we'll, we'll call it uh, winter, the cooler season, but not certainly what it was. So what to do? There's two really obvious answers, and then there's the one that is the speculative answer that we're going to talk about tonight. So let's start with the first obvious answer, mitigation. You know, let's do something about the greenhouse gases. And as you know, the efforts here are going to be very much directed towards ending uh, fossil fuel use. We're going to have to electrify almost everything and then make sure that that electric energy is cleanly generated. The things that are very hard to do uh, with electricity, we might have to create some other sources like hydrogen, for example. We're going to have to change how we do agriculture. We're going to have to reduce waste. We're going to have to reduce methane leakage. All of these things come under the banner of mitigation. Adaptation. That's something else we're going to have to do. We're going to have to find ways to live with this increased heat, with these increased floods. We're going to have to get innovative about our cities, about our design. We're going to have to provide a lot more things like refrigeration in places which uh, perhaps don't yet have them. We're going to have to provide air conditioning. We're going to have to get the dust and particulates out of the air in order that those uh, cardiopulmonary diseases don't get worse. There's a lot of stuff that we're going to have to do to live with these costs. That's plan A and plan B. What about plan C? Geoengineering. Who knows a little bit about geoengineering, just so I get a sense of the audience, like half of you maybe have heard about it a little bit. Um, this is going to be somewhat of an introduction to it. Um, so what is it? Let's define it. Geo, that means Earth, right? Engineering, we know what engineering is. So geoengineering is the intentional large-scale manipulation of the environment. But that's sort of not super helpful, is it? We can get more precise. This is a more precise definition that sounds a little much at first, but we can use this definition to start thinking about the different types of geoengineering. The manipulation of stocks and flows of components of the Earth's biogeochemical processes to alter the radiative balance of the atmosphere. That sounds like a lot, right? The next slide is going to show you exactly what that means. Think of the place we live as a balance between heat in and heat out. And so I'm a philosopher, not a scientist, right? So I'm not going to take this too far. But look at this world here. We've got heat coming in. And that's the big, wide, yellow arrow right in the middle of that image. And then we've got heat going out. And those are the two channels, one to the left and one to the right of heat exiting from the Earth. So you've got heat coming in from the sun, and you've got heat exiting and going back out into space. Life is good when the amount of heat coming in equals the amount of heat going out. Things get kind of sketchy when you have an imbalance between what's coming in and what's going out. That's the nub of our problem. We now have an imbalance between what's coming in. What's coming in is going to stay pretty constant, right? Because the sun's going to be up there doing its thing. But what's going out can get messed up. And it gets messed up by doing things like uh, putting a blanket in the place uh, where the clouds are. And so instead of heat passing up through the atmosphere and exiting into space, heat gets trapped in the atmosphere. And so if you look at that 235 on the right there, that big exiting channel, if that 235 gets reduced by greenhouse gases, 
you start to have a problem. Now, this I, you all know this, this is not news to any of you, but it's a good way for us to get our minds into what geoengineering is. Because geoengineering looks at this and says stocks and flows, balances, incoming, and it says we can maybe do something about this imbalance that we've created. It's essentially, if you're geoengineering by reflecting sunlight, and this is mostly what I'm gonna be talking about tonight, it's essentially a matter of bouncing heat. Bouncing heat out before it gets too embedded in the system. And if you look at the diagram on the right there, you can bounce heat out perhaps before it even enters the atmosphere by putting mirrors up in space. Or you've got some options once it has entered the atmosphere. You can put aerosols in the stratosphere. You can make your clouds whiter. You can make your surfaces of the earth, whether that's land or sea, you can make those a lighter color too. And all of those uh, changes are going to lead to more heat bouncing out of the system. Now, in order to keep things simple tonight, I'm going to focus on one of these types of geoengineering. And it's the one that has most attention right now. People are paying most attention to this. Most of the research focuses on this. And this is stratospheric aerosol geoengineering. So that layer there below space but above marine clouds, that's where the, the bouncing of energy out is going to take place if we decide to geoengineer. Everybody following so far? Okay, good. Um, so, geoengineering by reflecting sunlight. What I am not talking about here is I'm not saying anything about jet contrails. So don't think that you're listening to a lecture where someone's talking about the contrails that jets leave. That's just a, a product of what happens when you burn fuel in a jet engine up at about 35 or 40,000 feet. Uh, those contrails linger for a while, uh, but they are not geoengineering, okay? What I'm also not talking about is weather modification. Uh, this is an attempt to perhaps make it rain somewhere. You want it to rain or make it snow somewhere. You want it to snow. Uh, I think in, in the Beijing Olympics, there was some attempts at weather modification so that it rained outside of Beijing uh, and not on the Olympics themselves. Um, but I am not talking about weather modification either. I'm talking about geoengineering using stratospheric aerosols. So, this is not happening yet. This is not happening anywhere at the moment. But there are conversations about research and about what it would look like if you were to deploy geoengineering. So, we'll move into that now. What would it look like if you were to do it? It would probably look something like this. There'd be a balloon up in the stratosphere. And so the stratosphere starts, it kind of depends. It's different, but it's different between the poles and the equator. But the stratosphere tends to start around 40, 50,000 feet. Uh, and it goes up through 60, 70, up to 100, 150,000 feet and beyond. So we're talking above jet airplanes here. Um, you would hoist a balloon up into the stratosphere and you would dangle from that balloon a hose and that hose would pump uh, a liquid up there or a gas up there that would then get emitted by that balloon. And you can see what's happening there is that balloon's up in the stratospheric winds. And so what is getting emitted from that balloon is immediately getting blown off around the earth and it's forming a haze. It's forming a very thin kind of a cloud around the earth. And you can see that the sun is not able to get quite as much uh, warmth into the system as it was before. Um, it turns out that the most effective way to create this haze is by pumping the gas sulfur dioxide uh, up into the stratosphere. And uh, sulfur dioxide, once it's up in the stratosphere, reacts with water and it forms little droplets. And those droplets will create that haze up there. 
Now, here's, that's a diagram of what it would probably look like. Kind of weirdly, there's a volcano going off on the left-hand side of that diagram. And you sort of think, why is that happening? I'm, I'm trying to geoengineer. Um, I think it's in this diagram because it's, a, it's illustrating that the idea for geoengineering comes from what we've learned about volcanic eruptions. And in 1991, here's Mount Pinatubo going off. It ejected five cubic kilometers of material up into the stratosphere, up to 150,000 feet. So you can imagine a volcano goes off, a lot of what goes up comes down pretty quick. You know, you get these sort of ash cloud and it precipitates down and every surface has ash on it. But some of it goes up into the stratosphere and stays up into the stratosphere. Um, Mount Pinatubo put 20 million tons of gases and particles up into the stratosphere. And it turns out that that cooled the earth by half a degree C for two years. So a significant cooling consequence of this volcanic eruption. So you know in the United Nations climate talks, we're always discussing 1.5 degrees and two degrees C. Here from this one eruption, just like a one-time happening, uh, you got two, a two-year drop of 0.5 degrees C. And so you can imagine the engineers sort of thinking, hmm, there's some possibilities here. Now, Mount Pinatubo was pretty well tracked as far as the temperature changes it caused. There's a couple of other really interesting kind of cultural references to previous volcanic eruptions. So Mount uh, Tambura went off in 1815. It was a giant eruption and it made the planet cold. So that haze that was the result of all that material going up into the stratosphere, it cooled the planet down significantly. There was frost and snow in the summer in places that never saw frost in the summer. There was crop failure around the world. People starved. 1816 was called a year without a summer, or it was also called 1800 and froze to death. Um, and also, now you're thinking, all right, that's fine, but why is Frankenstein in this picture? <laughs> um, what also happened in 1816 is Mary Shelley took a vacation in Switzerland with her husband, with Lord Byron, and with Lord Byron's personal physician, John Polidori. They went there to sort of do a sound of music thing, you know, like Swiss Alps running around having picnics and, you know, singing up in the mountains. But it was such a lousy summer. It just rained and sleeted and snowed on them all summer long. They never got out. The uh, vacation was a disaster. So what they did is they stayed inside telling each other ghost stories and horror stories. Um, and it turned out that Lord Byron wrote one of his most miserable poems, Darkness, after that summer. Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. And John Polidori wrote a book called The Vampire. And it was apparently the first book about sort of vampires being our uh, nemeses. So there's a sort of cultural reference point to the cold that followed the eruption of Tambura. And then in 1883, Krakatoa went off, also caused cold, but caused these fantastic sunsets, which Edvard Munker uh, painted in the 1890s. And so I know when I was in college, everybody had that image of the scream up on their college dorm wall. Um, but that image is a consequence of the uh, material that was put up into the stratosphere by Krakatoa. So we know that volcanoes cool down the planet and we can be confident that if we could sort of fake a volcano, we could also cool down the planet. 
And so people are starting to discuss this, starting to ask what it would look like, what would the technologies be to do this. And perhaps the most uh, advanced project uh, directed towards this is one that's based at Harvard. It's funded by some philanthropic organizations, the Alfred Sloan Foundation, the Bill Gates Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. And what they would do is they would hoist a balloon and start depositing stuff in the stratosphere. And what's, this is sort of a, a, a test module here. The balloon goes up, there's that little device at the hanging from the balloon there that would emit the particles. And then this, in this case, you've got propellers on that device. And those propellers would, would start spinning and the uh, balloon would kind of go back around into the cloud and would start taking measurements of the optical properties in the cloud. And that's what's happening in C on the right there is you're taking those measurements. The first test of this was going to take place in 2021, and it was going to take place in Sweden. Uh, but it was abandoned when the Sami Council objected to doing this above Sami lands. And they said, you know, our job is to secure and safeguard the natural environment, and it doesn't look to us that what you're doing is going to help do that. It's not getting to the root causes. Uh, it's not leading to long-term long sustainability. So we object to running this experiment. So they pulled the experiment. Uh, important to know that this experiment would not have cooled the Earth at all, but it would have allowed a test of the deployment device, and it would have allowed a test of what the consequence of those particles would have been. So that experiment is still kind of waiting in the wings, but at the same time, and this is, this is a good time to be talking about uh, geoengineering. At the same time, we've started to see some federal money flowing towards research in geoengineering. So for a long time, governments around the world were not wanting to touch this with a 10-foot pole. Uh, there was a little bit of money going towards it in the UK, a little bit in Germany. The EU was designated some research money. China was putting some money in, but the US was going nowhere near it until 2019 in the Federal Appropriations Act. Uh, $4 million was designated towards research. So again, this is, not, this is not doing geoengineering, it is researching it. And then in subsequent years, we've had more monies in the latest federal appropriations in 2022. There was the mandate to develop a cross-agency group to coordinate a research plan and that research plan was to provide guidance on transparency and risk management and so forth. And with that money starting to flow, the taboo on geoengineering has started to break. So like I said, people didn't want to touch this before because they wanted to make it clear that they were doing plan A and plan B. No one wanted to say, well, I'm doing plan C already. People wouldn't touch it before, but they are now. And this article by Bill McKibben, the climate activist, came out in late November of last year. And he's basically saying here, people are talking about this now and we're getting closer to this. So be aware of it. Bill McKibben's article was in November. And then in December, a startup company called Make Sunsets, which is a horrible name for a geoengineering company, but they're thinking about the scream and Edvard Munch. Uh, Make Sunsets started filling balloons with sulfur gas and then letting them go up into the stratosphere where they were thinking the balloons would pop and the sulfur dioxide gas would dissipate and form those droplets and start forming hazes. So it's an upstart company. Uh, each balloon contained 10 grams of sulfur. Now compare that to 20 million tons that came out of Pinatubo. You realize that this is not like a serious geoengineering attempt, but the director of this little company that was doing this said, I see this as a political intervention. And here are some of the things that 
the, uh, the, the founder of this company said, which I think are, are interesting, he thinks there is a moral obligation to do this. If you're not doing it, you're watching people and you're watching species die. Uh, he is convinced, as many uh, atmospheric scientists are convinced, well, a number of atmospheric scientists are convinced um, that there is no other way to keep warming below two degrees C. Literally, there is no other way. When you look at the trajectory we're on and you look at how close we're getting to those limits, we're at about 1.2 degrees C right now. 1.5 was the aspirational goal in Paris. Two degrees is the goal that is thought to be the limit beyond which catastrophic harm would happen. But it already looks like a decent amount of catastrophic harm already at 1.2 degrees C. But Luke Eisman and other people who are in favor of these technologies suggest this is the only way that we can stay beneath that two degrees C limit. Now, there's a financial motivation here. You might not be surprised to know. Uh, Luke Eisman hopes at some point to sell cooling credits. And when he's announced this experiment, he said, well, one gram of sulfur is approximately cooling the equivalent to one ton of what carbon emissions are warming. So you know, if you're emitting a ton of carbon, then you buy a gram of sulfur off of them, and that will equal it out. Apparently, that has no basis in science whatsoever. It was just sort of a, you know, a, a number that could get put out there. Uh, that experiment happened in Baja, California, and the Mexican government immediately put out a ban on any future geoengineering experiments above their soil. So look at the date on this. This is January 20th, just 10 days ago. Um, so this is very much a live uh, happening kind of uh, issue that we need to start facing. So things are moving in this direction. We need to know they're moving in this direction, and we need to know how what we think about it. As an ethicist, I've got a few things to say about it. Um, and I'm going to borrow from an atmospheric scientist who's very against geoengineering. And this is a guy called Alan Robox, who's based at Rutgers. And years ago, when this discussion first came up in the early 2000s, Robock wrote this piece, 20 Reasons Why Geoengineering May Be a Bad Idea. And most of those 20 reasons still hold. We're now 14 years past when he wrote this article. He actually expanded it a few years later to write 26 reasons why geoengineering might be a bad idea. So he's like, he's keeping on building the reasons. But amongst those 20 reasons are the following. And I think these, all of these provide pretty good ethical uh, cautions against climate engineering with stratospheric aerosols. When you alter heat in, heat out, you alter how precipitation is formed because precipitation is a consequence of heat coming in in various places at a certain rate. And if you tweak that, you tweak what happens to rainfall. And one of the things that would happen with geoengineering with stratospheric aerosols is you would impact worldwide rainfall patterns. And it's not entirely clear which ones you would impact by how much. And this could be a problem if you depend on rainfall from a monsoon or something like that. So that was the first of Robox 20 reasons. Second reason, we're building a sunshade, right? Building a reflective barrier. That doesn't do anything about carbon. And the carbon stays in the atmosphere and it keeps acidifying the ocean. The carbon actually keeps building up. You're sort of hoping that you put the barrier up there for a while and people will do something about the carbon in the meantime. But if you don't do anything about the carbon in the meantime, the carbon keeps building up and you get ongoing ocean acidification. Because you have a haze up there, you would have decreases in solar power and you would get whiter skies. And did anybody read Elizabeth Colbert's book from a year or so ago, Under a White Sky? 
this is exactly what she was talking about in one of those chapters, is how geoengineering would make a pale sky. I mean, we had a beautiful blue sky yesterday in Missoula. Um, would it be a big loss if it, if it was a little paler? Yes, I mean, not compared from dying of a, of a, a drought or something like that, but it would be somewhat of a loss. But for Elizabeth Colbert, this is like an emblem of what geoengineering does. It creates these wider skies. Um, I mentioned that carbon doesn't get removed when you do this. Uh, and so if for some reason you had to stop geoengineering, you'd have all that carbon in the atmosphere and that would lead to rapid warming if you were no longer able to do it. You know, let's say the politics of it became too complicated or let's say that sulfur dioxide was creating another problem that you hadn't anticipated. You'd get rapid warming if you had to stop. The moral hazard of bad behavior, if you've got sort of a stopgap solution, then the incentive to do something, do something about the root cause of the problem, that incentive kind of starts to disappear, right? And so there is what they call a moral hazard. Uh, you might stop uh, decarbonizing your economy because you think, well, these geoengineers are going to keep the temperature down anyway, so we don't have to worry about it. And then finally, a problem which is essentially a political problem. Who would decide when to do it, how much to do it, when to stop doing it? Who would have their hand on the thermostat? And these political problems are ones that a lot of people think are the, the death knell of geoengineering. There's a British scientist called Mike Hume who wrote a book, Can Science Fix the Climate? And he concluded that geoengineering was ungovernable and undemocratic. But let's hear from the other side. So David Keith is somebody who is very much in favor of researching stratospheric aerosol geoengineering. Uh, David Keith is an extremely thoughtful person. He knows about ethics. He invites ethicists into his lab to talk about this uh, challenge. But, and Keith thinks that at least research, continuing to research geoengineering is worth doing. And how does he make that argument? First thing he says is we should only do this if we keep working on greenhouse gas reduction. So he's saying, this is not a moral hazard because we've got to keep working on that stuff. But if we do keep working on that stuff, then he says we should do this temporarily. So this is not permanent sun shading. It's a temporary deployment. It would benefit most people, especially the least well off. We could do it quickly. We could do it cheaply. And echoing what Luke Eisman said, he thinks it is the only way to shave the curve of temperatures. So that, that means the idea is temperatures are going up. We know they're going up. Hopefully they'll go down later. We're not really yet at that point where we can start talking about them going down. But Keith thinks that stratospheric aerosols can shave the top off that curve so that it doesn't get as high as it would have got. And he thinks that is the only way to shave that curve. So we've got two groups here. We've got those skeptical of geoengineering, and they think that even research, even this federal money that's going in this direction, is the beginning of a slippery slope towards eventual deployment. And then we've got people like Luke Eisman and David Keith, though they would hate to be mentioned in the same sentence there. Um, thinking this is at least a prudent backup. We should at least research this technology. And one of the points Keith made in an article that just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago, 2023 article in the Journal of Applied Philosophy, is that even if we fully comply with the Paris inten intended goals, the intended contributions, even if we fully comply, we would still need to bring down temperature because we're heading for about 2.7 degrees, best case scenario. But we're not even in that best case scenario. So we have to be realistic about the scenario we're in. And he thinks we should be at least researching for now and then presumably by implication, possibly at some point deploying uh, in order to make the planet habitable. 
So, what to do, how to decide. I want to step back again, and I want to remind you of the couple of images I had right at the start tonight. I was worried at the start that climate change was having us lose the natural world. I said, you know, we were in Earth 1 in the Holocene, and then we became Earth 2 in the Anthropocene. To geoengineer the planet, I think we'll be doing something else. It will be taking us from Earth 2 to Earth 3. Earth 2 was an accident. We heated it up because we were trying to improve standards of living, and we didn't realize the consequences of it. Earth 3, on the other hand, would be intentional. It would be shaping the atmosphere deliberately. We would have gone from the Holocene to the Anthropocene, and then into what I call the synthetic age. And if you have a big picture look at this, you may have a reaction to this idea of a synthetic age. Now, I wrote a book on it. Uh, I tried to stay right in the middle on this, and it was really interesting. Uh, some people thought I was just crazy pro-technology. I just loved the idea of the synthetic age. Other people thought I was you know, crazy skeptical of these technologies because they were the only things that were going to save us and they thought I hated the idea of the synthetic age. So I guess if I was annoying people on both sides, I was probably, maybe I was achieving what I, what I planned. Um, but in my discussion of geoengineering, what I came to realize as I was finishing up this book, what I came to realize is looking at the climate problem as a choice about whether to geoengineer or not is terribly depressing. Like I didn't like those options. Geoengineer and create a synthetic age or not geoengineer and have untold suffering and species loss. And so I found myself finishing that book, starting another book, pointing in a different direction. And I wanna kind of, my last few slides here are talking about this different direction. This next book is not about technology and engineering, it's about wildlife. And it's about wildlife recovery. Now how does this fit in to our whole conversation. I think when we look at our climate future, yeah, we can look at it like moving towards Earth 3, or we can look at it in terms of a form of restoration and rewilding. Let me give you a hint of what I mean by this rewilding business. One of the species I cover in this new book is the humpback whale. Do you know how humpback whales are doing right now, like around the globe? Well, badly. They're doing fantastically well. So in the North Pacific, 40 years ago, they were down to about 1,200 whales. They're now up to about 26,000. In the Western Indian Ocean, they were down to a low of about 600. They're now up to 36,000. Humpback whales are doing incredibly well. And humpback whales have something to say about carbon. Now, this fo these four diagrams here, don't worry about the writing. I'm borrowing somebody else's slide here. Uh, just look at the diagrams. They're a little bit cut off for some reason. But, um, on the left, you've got whales bringing, diving deep to feed and then coming up to the surface to excrete. What they're doing is they're bringing nutrients from the bottom of the ocean and they're depositing them at the top. When you deposit nutrients at the top of the ocean, you get phytoplankton growth. What does that phytoplankton do? It sucks carbon, and that carbon ends up at the bottom of the ocean. Second diagram, you've got whales feeding in Arctic and Antarctic areas, migrating to give birth in tropical areas. They're putting on all this weight in the Arctic and Antarctic, and then they're losing it in the tropical areas. How are they losing weight? They're excreting, and that fertilizes those tropical areas. Again, phytoplankton growth, carbon down the bottom of the ocean. In the third diagram, you've got all the carbon in the bodies of those whales. And then in the fourth one, you've got those whales dying, sinking to the bottom of the ocean where that carbon gets sequestered. Whales are pretty good carbon allies. The researcher who I discussed this with up in Alaska estimates that we've lost 96% of the carbon that whales used to sequester 
through whaling. And if we could just let those species recover, we would start to get that back. Humpbacks are estimated to be 95% recovered. So I look at humpback whales and I look at them as climate friends, climate partners, climate allies. And there's a whole cottage industry now, and you know, re read the numbers if you like, but I'm just putting this up to illustrate that there's a whole cottage industry of people trying to work out how helpful are these animals for sequestering carbon. One statistic that I really liked when I was looking into this work here is that if you let blue whales recover, so blue whales are the largest animal ever on Earth, larger than the largest dinosaur, um, the largest animal in the history of life on Earth. If you just let blue whales recover, that would be the equivalent of more than 100,000 acres of temperate rainforest in terms of its carbon reduction potential. Blue whales are currently at about 2% of the population they were at before whaling. So these are things that are known as natural carbon solutions. If you're doing it in the ocean, it's called blue carbon. Uh, if you're doing it on land, it tends to be called just natural carbon solutions. What are a couple of other blue carbon and natural carbon solutions? One of the ones in Alaska that I looked at, which was fascinating, was sea otters helping kelp forests. Like the recovery of sea otters lets kelp forests regenerate. Why? Because sea otters eat urchins, and urchins kill kelp forests. So if you can reduce the urchin population, those kelp forests can grow back up. And one of the numbers produced there by one of the scientists looking at this was that if you could recover otters in all of their natural habitat on the west coast of the United States, so all the way from uh, California up to the end of the Aleutian chain, you could sequester the equivalent of five million cars, the emissions of five million cars. So recover otters, and that cancels out up to, and this was the high end estimate, up to five million cars annual emissions. Here's another wildlife recovery that is, is remarkable. Wildebeest recovery in East Africa has caused there to be less burning of the savanna. Why? Because they graze down some of the woody debris. They, they keep the vegetation small enough that at the end of the summer it doesn't go off in a giant conflagration. Um, wildebeest, by reducing the amount of carbon that gets emitted through annual fires are causing the equivalent of East Africa's entire fossil fuel emissions to stay in the ground. That was true anyway when this study was done, which was a few years ago. Um, but it's just remarkable that it's, that it's true at all. Uh, one species recovering has compensated for all of East Africa's carbon emissions. And these natural climate solutions go on and on, whether it's at sea, whether it's on land with agriculture, or whether it's the wetting of peat bogs. So why am I talking about this in a geoengineering talk? Natural climate solutions are limited. They're not going to solve the problem themselves. So don't go away thinking, I have the answer. It's whales. Um, they're not going to solve the problem themselves, but Here's why I think they're worth looking at. One, you get two solutions for the price of one. At least you get progress on two things for the price of one. You get progress on carbon, and you get progress on biodiversity recovery. Two, this is what one of the whale scientists said to me. They may not solve the greenhouse gas problem immediately, but as emissions decline, those natural solutions become a more interesting portion of the whole. So I like that idea. But I especially like this idea. Those natural solutions are a reminder that climate change is not just a technology issue. It is also a consumption issue. It is also an economic issue. It is also a biodiversity issue. It is also a landscape issue. Yes, it is a technology issue, uh, but it's a number of other things too. And if you do read this book, Ministry of the Future, you will see that they eventually kind of muddle through the climate problem, but they muddle through it with a whole host of different strategies, including a little bit of geoengineering. 
but a lot of landscape recovery, a lot of economic transformation, some coercion, pressuring people to do better. But the solution is not one thing, it's a range of things. Now, am I skeptical of technology? Not even slightly. We're gonna have to do a lot of this. So this is sucking carbon out of the air. This is the world's first uh, direct air capture plant, which is in Iceland. And I put this slide up. You see the date on that? January the 12th, 2023. The first certified credits for directly capturing carbon out of the air and then putting that carbon into geological storage in the ground. Those were just issued just a couple of weeks ago. We're gonna need to do a lot of this stuff. So this is not a talk that is anti-technology even slightly. But what I do want you to think about in this talk, what I, the sort of thing I want you to take away from it is that we, we have a choice. We have a choice about the kind of earth that we want to call our home. Do we want it to be a synthetic age? Do we want it to be a Holocene Earth? Or do we want it to be somewhere in between? And so the question I want to leave you with is where on this spectrum do you want to be? So that's, I'm done. Happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you very much. What a great talk. Lots of fun. Hoping questions to start formulating your questions. I forgot to mention at the beginning if you're at home watching live stream, uh, feel free to try and email Climate Center at gonzaga.edu. And as we run out in the room, then I'll go to questions uh, from folks uh, online. Uh, we've just got one remote mic, which I'll run around. So we'll start off with Madden for first question. Um, so I'm Madden, I'm an environmental science student here, um, and I've definitely heard a lot of buzz around geoengineering, and I appreciate your acknowledgement of restoration as a valuable effort um, against climate change. Couple of things, one question I had is whether you'd researched at all into the public health effects of geoengineering for your book, because I've definitely read a lot about SO2 pollution, um, especially its impacts on people with asthma, um, or other respiratory infections, especially in the wake of COVID-19, I feel like that's a really relevant part to include when discussing geoengineering, because not just SO2, but what it forms as it sort of moves down the water column can be really dangerous for people. Um, and it can also form like particulate pollution and stuff. So first of all, I was wondering if you had done any research into that. Yeah, so I, I really recommend you go after this talk, go home and, and Google um, David Keith and Stephen Colbert. And Keith uh, published a book, The Case for Climate Engineering a few years ago. And Colbert had him on the show to talk about stratospheric aerosols and geoengineering. And it's very funny, uh, as you can imagine. But the, the piece that really sort of you take home from it is Keith is talking about the sulfur dioxide that goes up into the stratosphere. When it combines with water, do you remember I said it combines with water to form droplets? It's droplets of sulfuric acid. So. Colbert goes, sulfuric acid? Uh, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, you know, because eventually that stuff, it stays up in the stratosphere for a couple of years and then it eventually kind of precipitates out. Um, and so then Keith's on, on the back foot trying to sort of say, well, look, it's a little bit of sulfuric acid, um, but it's not, you know, compared to the suffering that uh, is being caused by climate change, it's not a significant amount. So that, you know, that's something that the scientists will have to haggle over, like whether it is a significant amount or not, and whether the losses that you're getting from climate change uh, are gonna be mitigated enough that you can accept those additional harms that will be a consequence uh, of geoengineering. And I think you know, that's, a, that's a, a technical and, and difficult kind of a question uh, to contemplate. Yeah, it's gonna have a lot of statistical modeling attached probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, my only other question was, oh my goodness, I'm blanking on where that's at the moment. Uh, Dr. Henning, would you be willing to talk about this one real quick? 
Any others have a question before? Matt, I'll come with it. She'll, she'll have just a second. I'm tempted to build on, on your answer while we take another question, because uh, I'm thinking of that same episode with Colbert and David Keith, which it really is worth Googling and looking at. And he mentions the number of, of, of deaths, increased deaths that would, would occur. I forget the exact number. I, I should remember. I've seen the clip so many times. Um, but I wonder, has anybody looked at the difference between sort of comparing active euthanasia and passive euthanasia to, to this issue? Because what we have now is people dying because of unintended consequences, foreseeable but unintended consequences. Whereas the, with geoengineering, we would do something and it, we would be actively doing something with the foreseeable consequence of an increased number of statistical deaths, which usually active euthanasia, bad, passive euthanasia, okay. Now, I'm not sure if healthcare ethicists would agree with that, but usually they want to make a distinction between the two. Does that question make any sense? Oh, is it, is it geoengineering totally an instance of sort of, not active euthanasia, but a, a sort of an analogous moral situation? Yeah, yeah, so actually, I, I, I'm smiling because I'm wondering if you, you set this up, because I wrote a paper on this. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I, I, I didn't one. know that, I didn't know that. <laughs> no, so it, it actually it presents an interesting question, right? Uh, the doctrine of double effects, right? Like the things you do intentionally or the things that happen as a consequence of what you're doing, but you were actually trying to do something else. You know, you were trying to cool down the planet, but you ended up causing some deaths. Um, so what in that paper, one of the things that, that I, one of the places I arrive in that paper is that, I, you know, I'm actually not a big fan of actively geoengineering, but there are some things that we do which increase the rate of climate change. And there's one, when I was heavily involved in this space, um, there was one law that passed which was reducing the sulfur content of marine diesel across all the world's shipping. And of course, you know, that's a great idea. And this, this gets back to your question, is it Madison, um, about, you know, the health effects. Reducing the sulfur content of marine diesel is a fantastic thing to do if you want to stop people dying of lung disease and you know, pollution in port cities. It's not a fantastic thing to do if you want the climate to stay cool. Because one of the statistics that came out when this law was being debated was that removing that sulfur from the fuel would cause the equivalent of 10 years of global warming at current rates which is a staggering uh, boost to global warming right when you don't want that boost to happen. So to, to Dr. Henning's question about um, intentional and unintentional actions, it, it struck me that there might be some things where you might slow down the cleanup of pollution. If you, if you, everybody gets what I'm talking about here. You might, there might be some things where if the harm of that pollution is not uh, enormously and immediately obvious, there might be some cases where the, the benefit analysis would fall on the side of slowing down the cleanup of that pollution so that you are not actively geoengineering, but you are keeping cooling in place for a while uh, until you have another way to, to reduce temperatures. Uh, again, it's a scientific issue. There's a lot of modeling and data crunching that would have to happen before you come to that, that conclusion. As a philosopher, I am in no position to do that. So do not follow my advice on this at all. Uh, but it, it's a thought that responds to your question a little bit. Um, I guess you kind of just answered my question because I was going to ask um, if we were doing it as a temporary solution, but rapid warming would occur if we stopped, then what would happen? Well, you, so it's a temporary solution if in the meantime, so you know, you're at the top of the curve, right? And, and that curve's a little lower because you're geoengineering, right? So instead of the curve going up and down, the curve kind of is a little lower. And then you've got to be pulling carbon out of the atmosphere like crazy while you're geoengineering. Uh, because then there will come a time, like if you're pulling the carbon out really fast, really aggressively, there will come a time when you can start to lessen those stratospheric aerosols. 
temperature will, you know, more heat will come into the atmosphere, but there'll be less carbon. And so you could hopefully get back to where you want to be. Um, Isn't the other possibility that we keep increasing emissions and have to keep increasing sulfur dioxide to match? So one thing I would say that, yes, you're, you are being skeptical and perhaps appropriately skeptical. Uh, but one thing I would say, say about that is this moral hazard argument 10 years ago, so I started working in the space in 2010. 10 years ago, the moral hazard argument was uh, extraordinarily powerful because we were doing nothing like what we needed to be doing. And you know, it was pretty clear that if you put a sunshade up there with particles, people are just gonna carry on with the fossil fuel economy. I think that is less true today. Uh, and in 10 years, there has been quite a lot of movement on reducing fossil fuel emissions. A great deal of movement in Europe who have been you know, really kind of world leaders on this. Uh, recently, in the last um, sort of seven or eight months or so, the United States is starting to catch up, uh, especially with the Inflation Reduction Act. And so I think the moral hazard argument, does, it still has some power, but it has less power than it had 10 years ago, where basically people were just gonna carry on business as usual. I think to some extent we've already run this experiment before um, in the 1970s uh, before uh, all of the regulations under the Clean Air Act in the US and the corresponding uh, laws and, and regulations in Europe. And that is before the widespread adoption of sulfur scrubbers on coal-fired power plants um, many utilities around the world, uh, particularly in the US and in Europe, were mitigating ground level pollution by building polymer stacks. I don't know if you've ever flown over West Virginia and Ohio, uh, along the Ohio River on a cloudy day. Um, I think it's different now than what it was in the 70s and early 80s, but I used to fly those routes quite a lot. And I remember one particular time, a very cloudy day, you could see where the Ohio River was by the smokestacks that were penetrating the cloud layer. All those power plants along the, the Ohio River. What they were doing were injecting sulfur dioxide very, very high into the atmosphere before the adoption of scrubbers. And in, I think there was documented sort of cooling associated oh, yeah. with that. Yeah. I wonder if David Keith and others may have analyzed that experiment um, sort of un through the present day lens. Yeah, well, so, you know, the, the, you remember that diagram I had at the beginning with the arrows kind of going in all sorts of directions? Um, it, it's, you know, the technical term is radiative forcing. And there's positive forcing and negative forcing. You know, one is a heating effect and one is a cooling effect. Um, and you know, there is no doubt that burning coal, uh, there is a cooling effect to burning coal. Now there's also a warming effect, right? Because you, you know, you're burning fossil fuels, but those particulates create a cooling effect. Um, and so when, when you look at the, uh, the diagrams in the IPCC reports, you know, this sort of wealth of knowledge that gets dropped on us every you know, five or six years, uh, in the latest assessment reports. You see these, these bars that uh, have positive forcing and some of them have negative forcing. Um, and so it is true that every time you clean up pollution, you are removing some negative forcing. <laughs> and you know, the negative forcing, uh, horrible from a pollution standpoint, but quite good from a climate standpoint. And so these are like cost-benefit decisions that are very, very difficult decisions to make, I think. Hi. Um, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember my question. I just wanted to get some of the details right, so I was looking things up in the meantime. I'm interested if you know anything more about the carbon capture device in Iceland. That's very recent news, obviously. Um, as you mentioned, I think January 12th um, was when that permit was issued. So. I know a lot about climate capture devices in the American South because that's something I've researched for class before. 
Um, and I know that they're not nearly as efficient at this juncture as them in need to be. I guess since you've done um, sort of more work into this subject than I have, do you think that we're at the point where we're creating carbon capture devices to the point where that shaving the curve scenario is possible? Not even plausible, but just like, do you think that that is a potential way forward or more of just like a theoretical, like, like a, a, a thought experiment? Yeah, so um, when people used to talk about geoengineering, they would say geoengineering is of two kinds. There's the bouncing of heat kind, and there's the carbon dioxide removal kind. Um, and literally, the discussion would always have to cover both kinds. And today, I mostly covered only the bouncing heat kind, and I only did the carbon removal one with that one slide kind of right at the end. Um, because to me, they're not even in the same conversation, or that they shouldn't be in the same conversation. Removing carbon from the atmosphere is something we have to do. And we have to deploy it as quickly as we can and in as many different ways as we can. I would like to deploy some whales. Uh, but I would also like to deploy more of those direct air capture devices that there, one is in operation in Iceland right now, a second one is being built. The carbon dioxide removal is, a, is the long game. Uh, we have to build tens or hundreds of thousands of those devices. That, that one that you saw the photo of, it removes 5,000 tons of carbon per year. Uh, we're currently emitting about close to 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. So uh, 40 billion tons compared to 5,000 tons being removed. So we are nowhere close. And the, the people who bought those credits, uh, that's what the headline was. It, it was the first certified credits where money was changing hands, were paying $600 a ton. And the market rate for carbon, uh, if this were to really be viable, would be somewhere closer to $100 a ton. So it's six times more expensive right now than it would need to be. It's no coincidence that that plant is in Iceland, because in Iceland you can use geothermal energy, and you don't have to spend a lot of energy sucking that carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, because of course, if you're spending a lot of energy sucking carbon out of the atmosphere, you, you're not gaining anything unless that energy is clean. In Iceland, it's clean because it's geothermal energy. Elsewhere, the energy is not clean. So this is a long answer to, are we anywhere close? No but we got to start, and not removing carbon is not an option. Let's end there. Let's thank our speaker, Dr. Preston. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. I hope to see you again at an event soon. We have our next uh, talk on February 7th, uh, and that will be a, a Zoom event. You can go to gonzaga.edu slash climate center events to register. Thanks, and I hope to see you at an event soon. <laughs>